Hi guys, I am Dark Desert Highway, and today um, I'm doing a Bible study because what I want to do is so into my flesh right now. I want to sin, um, and that's what my flesh is is reaching out for. It's reaching out to be satisfied. It wants things that God says are not good uh, in my life. So um, what I'm going to do is so into righteousness. I'm going to practice righteousness by um, getting into the word of God and sharing with you the good things that God has uh, for us in his word. And that's why we read the Bible on this channel, because what I'm doing is practicing righteousness. I'm taking the things I know to be true about God and I'm giving them away. It's like, it's like seeds. And what is, what does God say? Uh, he says, um, in, Well, let's jump in. Let's jump into Galatians 6, verse 8 here. I'm going to open up my scripture. I actually did this Bible study already. I recorded it. It was an hour long, and then I realized I had no audio. So that's why I'm not set up. Today we want to talk about sowing into the flesh, what it's going to get us, and how to sow into righteousness. Um, so substituting what... I would do for what God says is right to do. And my software is not opening for some reason. Okay. So first we're going to go to Galatians 6, 8. I am using... The Christian Standard Bible. Galatians 6 verse 8 says, let's, let's look at verse 6. Let the one who is taught the word share all his good things with the teacher. So let the one who is taught the word share. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a person sows, he will also reap. Because the one who sows to his flesh will reap destruction from the flesh. But the one who sows to the Spirit will reap eternal life from the Spirit. Let us not get tired of doing good. For we will reap at the proper time if we don't give up. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us work for the good of all especially for those who belong to the household of faith. So, look, we've learned that there's basically two, two functions. There's sowing into this flesh or sowing into righteousness, sowing into the spirit. So right now I have a choice. Uh, it's come to it that my flesh desires something. What it wants is pornography, um, and what is going to happen if I invest into that is I am investing into corruption and I will reap corruption, corruption from it because I have sowed into an action. I have taken action and have procured by my power uh, and my will the thing that will eventually destroy me because sin in its full maturity is death. So by sinning, I am courting death in a relationship and um, I may not die um, because my sin may not be in its full maturity. But what's sin when it's not fully mature? It's disease and sicknesses. And, um, and uh, what is it when you have arguments with your family? It's, um, uh, it's a problem. It becomes a problem. Um, uh, can, 
um, fights, like fights, um, you know. So if I sow to the flesh, I'm going to reap corruption. If I sow to the spirit, I'm going to, I'm going to reap righteousness. Um, let's look at, okay, so there are spiritual laws. There's spiritual laws that govern our world, just like there are physical laws that govern our world, like gravity and time. And um, what has happened in the scientific community is they have identified a cause and, and result type of scenario that if you do this, then this will be the direct um, consequence of this thing. And no matter where it starts, it always has this result. Um, those are the physical laws that govern the world. Um, but because of the way that God has created the world with the spoken word of his mouth, he has established a framework of operation. Everything operates based on the word of the Lord. So let's look at um, Hebrews 11.3. And we're looking for the King James Version. Here it is right here. Through faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God. So the things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. But what we understand through faith in God that he exists is that God framed the world with his words. God spoke and it was going all the way back to Genesis. He said, let there be light. He said, let this happen. Let this happen. And by the spoken word of the Lord's mouth, he framed uh, the worlds. So um, it works because of the word. And so there's boundaries. There's boundaries that say, um, if you, then you. If you sow into flesh, you will reap corruption. You will. If you sow into the spirit, you will reap righteousness. Um, so there's a lot of if and then statements in the Bible. And those, I'd like to point out, are the laws of the Bible. Let's look at if and then statements. If this, then that scripture. So, Second Chronicles, we're going to look at a bunch of different scenarios. Second Chronicles 7.14 says, If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and heal their land. So, Matthew 17.20, If you have faith as a grain of a mustard seed, then you may say to this mountain, remove from here to over there, and it shall remove, and nothing shall be impossible to you. Um, so let's see if there's any more. John 14, 23. Jesus answered and said, if a man loves me, he will keep my words. Then... My father will love him and will come to him and will make our living place with him. So these are guaranteed scriptures. That's what you're looking at right here. Spiritual laws. If you do this, then I will do that. And these are the rules that God has governed uh, spirituality by um, and we can have confidence that if we fill our portion, our portion in faith, 
is to take God at his word. And then we will have a result. I like 2 Chronicles 7, 14. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and heal their land. These are very stable um, principles that we can be confident in that if we, then God. And I want to show you this principle because it's a spiritual uh, a governing principle. And we can, by applying these types of statements, whenever you see an if and then statement, apply it to your life and look for God to act on your behalf. And this will build confidence in you that God is a fulfiller of his word. He watches over his word to show himself um, true to those who heart, whose hearts are fully belong to him. God watches his word to perform it. Then the Lord said to me, you have seen well, for I am alert and active, watching over my word to perform it. The King James Version says, I will hasten my word to perform it. New King James Version says, for I am ready to perform my word. And the NIV says, for I am watching to see that my word is fulfilled. So he's alive and active. And he's waiting for people to step into these spiritual principles. Because they're there for us to sow into. So there's two things. We could sow into the flesh or we could sow into righteousness. And that's what we're going to look at today. So um, Romans 7, 18 through 24. And this is, this is my struggle. Um, my struggle is that I want to do what is wrong. But I know the good that I should do in place of the wrong that I would do. And this man is going through the same thing. Romans 7, uh, 18 through 24. So he says, for I know that nothing good lives in me, that is, in my flesh. For the desire to do what is good is with me, but there is no ability to do it. For I do not do the good that I want to do, but I practice the evil that I do not want to do. Now, if I do what I do not want, I am no longer the one that does it, but the sin that lives in me. So I discover this law. When I want to do what is good, evil is present with me. For in my inner self, I delight in God's law. But I see a different law in the parts of my body, waging war against the law of my mind and taking me prisoner to the law of sin in the parts of my body. What a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ, our Lord, so that with my mind, I myself am serving the law of God but with my flesh, the law of sin. So he saw the division. A division has been made in our bodies once we have come to the knowledge of the Lord of, uh, uh, of heaven. And, and he causes a division and a new creation is created. Once the spirit comes to live in you, you are a new creation. Um, but I'm still in this this flesh body, this skin, right? And it wants what it wants. And what it wants is sinful. And I know better. And this is what I've discovered recently because I backslid January till uh, about like a week ago. You know, I was actively involved in sowing into my flesh. And what I... Over the course of about four months, what I discovered was that it made me miserable. Uh, I was depressed, you know, because I have a knowledge of God. And I know that what I'm doing is wrong before his eyes. I had to deliberately separate myself from God, from the position I was walking with him in, 
to go search out and satisfy the, the things of my flesh. Um, and uh, I'm not sure if I've um, experienced all of the the w what I'm to reap from from doing this, but I know that it's affected my relationship with God. I don't feel Him uh, as close as I had, and the Holy Spirit is very quiet right now. And I think he's waiting. I think he's angry at me because he's revealed to me who he is and that he's alive. And you'd think that a personal revelation like this, I would have an unstoppable faith. But I struggle. I struggle. And I, I wanted to sin, and that's why I'm doing the Bible study. So instead of sinning in the way that I wanted right now, I opened up the Bible and started reading and sharing so i'm practicing righteousness it's a it's a practice you have to fully um in intentionally uh come to a place where you share what god has done for you and you speak about um his righteousness and his justice and who he is um you know, and I practice, I'm practicing righteousness right now by investing into the spirit, by sharing the word of God. Um, let's look at, um, so, so, so here's the thing. Because we know that we're in this war, that there is a war raging in our bodies, um, on the one hand, my body wants things that's going to destroy it. And on the other hand, I have opportunity to invest into spiritual things. I must make a choice. Let's look at um, Hebrews 12. Hebrews 12, 12 through 25. Therefore, strengthen your tired hands and weakened knees and make straight paths for your feet so that what is lame may not be dislocated but healed instead. So you're going to go from a, a place where at first you were just lame, but then injured, you continued on the path. Um, and it may be that you suffer further injury. Uh but this this is something that doesn't need to happen, you know. Uh, look, strengthen your hands and your weak knees, and make straight paths for your feet to be healed. So, I've gone out of the way to invest in my flesh, and the consequences are manifesting in my life, and they're manifesting negatively because God's not mocked. Whatever you reap, you will sow. Because a spiritual law is at work here that governs um, all spiritual things and the worlds are framed up by God's words. So by directly opposing God's words and, and practicing my sin, I'm receiving the consequences of that. And before things get worse, hold on, before things get worse, tired Strengthen your tired hands and weaken knees and make straight paths for your feet so that what is lame may not be dislocated, but healed and said, pursue peace with everyone and holiness without it. No one will see the Lord. Make sure that no one falls short of the grace of God and that no root of bitterness springs up, causing trouble and defiling many and make sure that there isn't any immoral or irreverent person like Esau who sold his birthright in exchange for a single meal. You know that later, when he wanted to inherit the blessing, he was rejected, even though he sought it with tears because he didn't find an opportunity for repentance. So check this out. Esau, he was uh, given the promise of an inheritance. Um, like Just like the Hebrew nation, when they were freed from their captivity of Egypt, were given a promise of inheritance. 
but they had to get to the place of promise. They had to get to the place of the promise. They had to go from their freedom and captivity through the wilderness into the promised land. And it was between the time of their uh, freedom from their captivity in between is where they screwed it up. They messed it up. Uh, so just because you have the promise doesn't mean that you've come into the possession of the promise yet. There's a journey. There's, there's a path. Um, there's a journey through the wilderness to get from point A to point B. And what the Israelites did is they complained. They murmured. They, they built a calf. They worshiped false gods. Um, they practiced unrighteousness they practice fulfilling their own desires for their for, for the rewards um that the flesh you know uh uh the consequences you know but they may not you don't always see it that way all you're looking for is the gratification that instant gratification and then you get it and um you know you've got what you've got but here it is the consequence of your behavior, the consequence of Esau's behavior, is that he had a desire in the flesh to eat. So he used his position to leverage a meal for himself, a bowl of soup. And he leveraged his position as an inheritor of the promise and gave that up to another man in order to take part in the soup that was going to satisfy his flesh. Now he ate the soup. Uh, this, the flesh was satisfied, but he lost the inheritance because he gave it away. He leveraged his position um, in order to de fulfill the desires of the flesh. Then later, once the consequence had happened and he had realized what he had done, he, he sought that inheritance once again but was not able to find any opportunity for repentance um, because he was rejected. For you know later that when he wanted to inherit the blessing, he was rejected. And though he sought it with tears, he didn't find any opportunity for repentance. It was a done deal. He gave it up. And that's where we need to be careful because we're not in heaven yet. You know, we may be saved. We may have the Holy Spirit and the promise of prosperity through the good things that God has for us, right? Just like the Israelites, the promise of prosperity in the in in the the holy land that God was about to bring them into, but they never entered it. They died in the desert. It was their children who had an opportunity to enter the promised land. The promised land was still there, but uh, and and the promise was still there. But the promise transitioned from those that were freed from Israel to their children because of their disobedience. And they died in the wilderness because of their disobedience, because of what they sowed into. The consequence of, of, of all that was death, death in the desert before they ever even got to receive, to take hold of of the, the, the promise. So you can have that, but you need to take hold of that. Um, uh, let's look at James five. So here's what we do. Uh, James five, 15 through 16. The prayer of faith will save the sick person, and the Lord will raise him up. If he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another so that you may be healed. The prayer of the righteous person is very powerful in its effect. So here's the deal. Considering that we may have already involved ourselves into our sinfulness. What we need to do is not keep it a secret. Don't keep your sins secret from one another because then you give power to the sin in secrecy. 
it will come back to you and say, we didn't get caught. Nothing bad happened. Um, let's do it again. Let's continue on this path. Nobody knows. Nobody will find out. You can have it all to yourself. And you've seen how little of an impact it's had on your life when you did it once. Let's do it again. Um, and then you strengthen your sin by repeatedly investing into it over and over and over again. And it becomes a stronghold in your life. You know, the devil might not have done it to you. You did it to yourself by what you practiced. You practiced sowing seeds to the flesh. You're going to reap corruption. It's going to come to a head. So before you get to that point, let's check this out. We're sick. We're sick with our sin. The prayer of the faith will save the sick person and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. So come come to conclude the matter that you're sinning. Let's, let's, um, what do we do if we're in that situation? What if we do if we're lost in the midst of uh, sowing into the flesh and we're stuck in a destructive pattern of repeating it? You know, he says, confess it. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another so that you may be healed. Um, the prayer of the righteous person is very powerful in effect. Now, God is willing to forgive us. Uh, if you're still alive, there's still time. Um, when you step, when you turn your foot from the evil way and you purpose it in your heart to humble yourself before God, he will respond and he's willing. So if you're still alive, you still have a chance. Um, let's uh, look at um, Proverbs 1, 31. Wow, I really messed that up. Proverbs 1. Thirty-one through thirty-three. Let's check this out. Let's check this out from the beginning. How long in verse twenty-two? Inexperienced one, will you love ignorance? How long will you mockers enjoy mocking, and you fools hate knowledge? If you respond to my warning, then I will pour out my spirit on you, and I will teach you my words. Since I called out and you refuse, extended my hand and no one paid attention, since you neglected all of my counsel and did not accept my correction, I, in turn, will laugh at your calamity. I will mock you when terror strikes you. When terror strikes you like a storm and your calamity comes like a whirlwind, when trouble and stress overcome you, they will call to me, but I won't answer. They will search for me, but won't find me. Because they hated knowledge, didn't choose to fear the Lord, were not interested in my counsel, and rejected all of my correction. They will eat the fruit of their own way, and be glutted with their own schemes. For the apostasy of the inexperienced will kill them, and the complacency of fools will destroy them. But whoever listens to me will live securely and be under undisturbed by the dread of danger. Let's look at Proverbs 1, 31 through 33. They will eat the fruit of their own ways and be filled with the fruit of their own schemes. For the waywardness of the simple will kill them and the complacency of fools will destroy them. But whoever listens to me will live in safety and be at ease. Let's look at Hosea 
10, 11 through 13. I'm going to go old school with it. Hosea, chapter 10, 11 through 13. Twelve. Sow righteousness for yourselves and reap faithful love. Break up your unplowed ground. It's time to seek the Lord until he comes and sends righteousness on you like the rain. You have plowed wickedness and reaped injustice. You have eaten the fruit of lies because you have trusted in your own way. So, so, sow righteousness for yourselves and reap faithful love. It's time to seek the Lord. If you're here right now listening to this, you have time. You need to abandon your sin, throw away your idols, get rid of anything that serves a uh, form of whatever you use to satisfy your flesh. If you're smoking dope, get rid of your drugs, get rid of your pipes. If you got pornography as an issue, get rid of your, you know, stuff. Get get rid of the things that are associated with your sin. Throw it out. And then come to God in your heart with a heart position of I'm going to humble myself now, Lord, before you and um, practice uh, doing what is righteous before your eyes instead of doing with what is evil. And how long does it take for God to respond to something like that? How long? When does he notice at the first moment you set your heart Daniel 10:12 Then he said to me fear not Daniel for from the first day that you set your heart on understanding this and on humbling yourself before your God your words were heard and I have come in response to your words so instead of doing what you want to do, what the flesh wants to do, we need to sow in righteousness. So how do you sow in righteousness? Um, let's look up the fact that God provides. Um, God provides. So... Luke six thirty eight thirty eight says, Give, and it will be given to you a good measure pressed down, shaken together, and running over, will be poured into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. So the commandment is to give. If you give, then God will give it back to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over, will be poured into your lap. Um Second Corinthians nine ten through eleven. Now so where do we get the things to give? Now the one who provides seed for the sower and bread for food will also provide and multiply your seed and increase the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way for all generosity, which produces thanksgiving to God through us. For the ministry of this service is not only supplying the needs of the saints, but is also overflowing in many expressions of thanks to God. 
because of the proof provided by this ministry, they will glorify God for your obedient confession of the gospel of Christ and for your generosity in sharing with them and with everyone. Okay, so the one who provides the seed for the sower and bread for food, that's God. So God is going to enrich you in every way for all generosity. It's not your generosity. It's God's generosity. That's why it says for all generosity. And it doesn't give you the article of you in there. What they're saying is that God is generous. He gives seed for the sower and bread for food. And he will multiply your seed and increase the harvest of your righteousness. So that what? So you can have the ministry of service in supplying the needs of the saints. Um, and the proof of God's provision provided by this ministry will result in God's glory for your obedient confession of the gospel of Christ and for your generosity in sharing with them and with everybody. So uh, your look when you when you look to stop investing in your sin, you come to God and you humble yourself before him, he gives an opportunity and he provides the provisions necessary for you to sow in righteousness. They're already prepared for us. All we have to do is identify what we can do in the moment, how we can, um, how the, the different ways that we can um, sow into righteousness. And he, he gives us that. Um, he gives us the, okay, but first, it depends on how much you give. So 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 9 verse 6 through 7. The point is this. The person who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and the person who sows generously will also reap generously. Each person should do as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or out of compulsion, since God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make every grace overflow to you so that in every way, in every way, also having everything you need, you may excel in every good work. As it is written, he distributed freely, he gave to the poor, his righteousness endures forever. So he's going to provide the seed. He's going to provide the method of, of investment. Um, and you're going to have to practice righteousness. Um, it's a practice. It's like a craft. So instead of uh, doing what you want to do, substitute it with what God wants to do. What, what, what does He want? What does He want us to do? Um, Matthew twenty-five. Thirty-five through forty-six. says, for I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you took me in. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you took care of me. I was in prison and you visited me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty or give you something to drink? Um, when did we see you a stranger and take you in or without clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will answer them, Truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. Then he will also say to those on the left, Depart from me, you who are cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger and you didn't take me in. I was naked and you didn't clothe me, sick and in prison and you didn't take care of me. Then they too will answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or without clothes or sick or in prison and not help you? Then he will answer them, truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these, you did 
whatever you did not do for one of the least of these, you did not do for me. And they will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. Um, let's look at Malachi 3.10. This is the only, it's the only place in the Bible where God actually challenges you to test him. Test him in this. Start at 7. Since the days of your ancestors, you have turned away from my statutes and you have not kept them. Return to me and I will return to you. That's, that's one of those if and then statements. If you return to me, I will return to you. So there's those spiritual laws that are in effect. You're going to fulfill your portion by returning to the Lord, and he's going to fill, fulfill his portion by returning to you. Yet you ask, how can we return? How can, at this point, how can we even start to return to you, God? And he says, will a man rob God, yet you are robbing me? How do we rob you, you ask? By not making the payments of the tenth and the contributions, you are suffering under a curse. Yet you, the whole nation, are still robbing me. Bring the full tenth into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. Test me in this way, says the Lord of armies. See if I will not open the floodgates of heaven and pour out a blessing for you without measure. I will rebuke the devourer for you, so that it will not ruin the produce of your land. And your vine and your field will not fail to produce fruit, says the Lord of armies. Then all the nations will consider you fortunate, for you will be a delightful land, says the Lord of armies. Oh, let's keep going. Your words against me are harsh, says the Lord. Yet you asked, where have we spoken against you? You have said it is useless to serve God. What have we gained by keeping his requirements and walking mournfully before the Lord of armies? Um, so, look, here's the deal. There's two ways that you can go. I can continue to sin and make a practice of my sin and fortifying the structure of its place in my life by doing it over and over and over again. But I've been freed from all that. Um, what I've come to identify is that part of me still wants the things that I've been freed from. And um, I must refuse to give it what it wants. I have to suffer. Um, so... Let's look at this. The present suffering <sighs> Romans eight eighteen. Verse 12, so then, brothers and sisters, we are not obligated to the flesh to live according to the flesh. So just because I have the desire, there's actually no obligation for me to fulfill it. And that's what I need to realize is that just because I had a thought doesn't mean that I actually need to go out and carry out and procure for myself the sin of that thought. And this is where you take you know, thoughts captive to to God, everything that, that stands up against God in opposition to him, we're supposed to take those thoughts captive. And I, I have them every day. Every day I want to drink. I want women. I want pornography. I want drugs. Uh, and I can feel it in me reaching out to get these things. And I pass by people who are doing these things, and I want to be a part of that. But I must refuse I must deny my flesh what it's saying it wants 
because I'm not obligated. I don't have to. There's nothing that says that just because I have a thought, I'm obligated to carry it out. But if you are living according to the flesh, you are going to die. You're going to die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For those, for all those led by God's Spirit are God's sons. For you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear. Instead, you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. For the Spirit himself testifies together with our spirit that we are God's children. And if we are children, also heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him so that he may also, oh, so that we may also be glorified with him. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is going to be revealed to us. For the creation eagerly awaits with anticipation for God's sons to be revealed. Okay, so so I'm not obligated, which is amazing to know, because there's nothing that says that I have to when the flesh proposes an idea in which it wants to satisfy itself. Not obligated. You can do this. You can deny the flesh. Then, instead of doing what you want to do, you can practice righteousness by putting the principles, those laws, into effect. The if and then laws. You know, if you, then, then I. And um, you can guarantee the fulfillment of those scriptures in your life because you can hold God accountable. Ooh, can you hold God accountable? It's not like that, really. It's, it's like um, we're not coming to God to demand the promise. But what he's given us is the right to expect him to live up to his word, to fulfill his portion of the scripture. Let's look at that. Um, uh, for the Lord watches over the word to Jeremiah one twelve. Then said the Lord to me, You have seen well. For I am alert and active, watching over my word to perform it. New King James Version says, For I will hasten my word to perform it. Um, for I am ready to perform my words. The NIV says, For I am watching to see that my word is fulfilled. And also, um, The Lord's eyes go to and fro for the eyes of the Lord range throughout the earth to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to him. The eyes of the Lord search the whole earth in order to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to him. So if you put yourself in a position to abstain from going and getting whatever your body wants and you refuse it and you suffer because you're not getting what you want. So there's a struggle and then do the struggle, feel the struggle, then take a principle from God that you found in his word and start to activate God's word in your life. If, if you, and then wait for God to respond and fulfill his word because he's looking throughout the earth to show himself strong to those whose hearts are fully committed to him. 
And then the Lord says, look, you've seen well, for I am alert and active, watching over my word to perform it. He's ready to meet you if you're willing to meet him. But here's the thing. We cannot abandon the Lord. Because if I abandon the Lord in disobedience, he is going to abandon me. King James, 2 Chronicles 15, 2. And he went out to meet Asa and said unto them, Hear me, Asa, for all Judah and Benjamin, and all Judah and Benjamin, the Lord is with you while you be with him. And if you seek him, he will be found by you. But if you forsake him, he will forsake you. So I can't carry on in unrighteousness because the Lord will, if I abandon him, he's going to abandon me. But if you abandon, turn away from him, he will abandon and turn away from you. So look, guys, that was um, that was tough because my first Bible study, the audio didn't work. And so I had to create this second Bible study to make sure that I didn't miss any scriptures here. So what do I do in response to myself when the overwhelming desire comes upon me to go get the things that God says that I shouldn't touch? Well, I refuse. I refuse because I'm not obligated to fulfill the desires of the flesh. Um, I'm not looking, and, and, and that's what I realized over the last four months, because I went back to doing and fulfilling all the desires that I wanted to fulfill. And I did it for about four months, and I became miserable and depressed. I knew that I was walking away from God. I, I knew that I wasn't doing what was right before his eyes. You know, um, do what's right before his eyes. Deuteronomy 16:18. Do what is right and good in the Lord's sight so that it may, may go well with you and you may go in and take over the good land the Lord promised uh, an oath to your ancestors. Well, you know, we're an inheritance. Uh, we have an inheritance and a promise with God waiting for us. But, you know, just like the Hebrew nation when it was freed from its captivity, um, you know, they did never made it to the promised land because of the way that they lived their lives. And they died uh, because of it. And um, they never received the promise. So being an example for today, we look in the stories of, uh, of the Old Testament and we see how God responds to people when they do things. Um, which is why it's really good to familiarize yourself with the Bible. Um, and there's one more scripture I really wanted to do. But I can't find it. So I guess that's where I'm going to leave you off today. I, if you made it to the end of the Bible study, um, go ahead and hit that like and subscribe button comment and I'll get back to you.